do want to talk about is really cultural value. Um, and in all the you know, papers that we've been listening to so far, why we want to do all of this, why we actually want to preserve things, um, what it is about our experience of cultural heritage that makes it um, relevant and important. But also what I'd like to point out is that the value of cultural heritage can shift and change over time. And I've certainly learned that um, in my own projects. Um, and I hope that this will lead on to some more specific discussions that we're going to have later today. One of the things that uh, Professor Mergos didn't mention is that I was also part of um, a national initiative in the UK called Science and Heritage, where we were trying to create a new kind of discipline with the um, natural sciences, the hard sciences, coming into the service of the preservation and conservation of heritage. And it produced a lot of research, a lot of collaborative doctoral um, projects, as well as um, postdoctoral projects. And I wonder here, if in this room, <coughs> with the Inherit program, if we're actually going to be moving towards something that, again, is in coming together of different disciplines to produce a new kind of um, field, paradigm, or the domain. Oh, I don't seem to have my PowerPoint. And that brings me on to my final <laughs> thing, that I had a technological meltdown this morning. So I'm going to claim the prize of the worst PowerPoint of the whole conference, <laughs> because if I'm afraid it's rather blurred um, and fuzzy, if it's actually going to appear. Thank you. Great. Now, I was asked to talk about the cultural landscape and public space from a transnational perspective. And in doing so, what I want to do is think about these different kinds of cultural and shifting values. Now, public open space, both in its ideological character and effects, has become increasingly recognised as a topic of central importance to a broad range of disciplines. And in recent years, rapid economic growth and urbanisation means space is at a premium. Open space in urban environments is vulnerable as it's easily subsumed to accommodate growing populations. And I think we've seen that hinted at in some of the presentations we've already had today. Yet historically, open space, particularly green spaces such as public parks and gardens, has been a benefit to the local community as a site of social exchange and has made an aesthetic contribution to the urban topography. Today, the transnational legacy of these traditional urban spaces, whether they be parks or buildings or agglomerations of buildings, can be seen as an environmental burden, whilst at the same time offering a window onto the past. And here, what I want to focus on is how these kinds of cultural spaces operate both as a signifier of heritage and as an agent of transformation in a transnational context. And I want to make specific reference to two of my um, research projects, one being uh, the cultural heritage and landscapes in China, and particularly the city of Tianjin, and also the more, <coughs> more broadly the notion of cultural landscapes and their ambivalent geographies um, in the Middle East. And if I have any time, I'd also like to suggest some theoretical paradigms which might enable us to think about these ideas. Now, my project um, on ambivalent geographies was really looking at renegotiating the intellectual boundaries of urban topographies and to critically engage with the past and try and think of a new way of thinking about how we can look at particularly colonial legacies um, in the Middle East. Um, it was a project held with the um, Middle East Technical University in Ankara and we had numerous uh, pockets of funding, including a, a large grant from the British Academy. And over a period of years, we invited a number of scholars um, from uh, the Middle East, including Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Egypt, to come and discuss their cultural landscapes in terms of urban planning, public open space, and the architectural design of cities in both the Ottoman and the post-Ottoman period. And of course, being you know the, the sort of Brit on all of this, I was just you know very embarrassed at Britain's you know, behaviour in the Middle East, <laughs> particularly in, in, in the post-Ottoman period. But everybody left their politics at the door, and what we learned was that there was a great deal of cultural exchange, and we were able to fracture some consolidated visions of which had privileged the West in looking at how cultural heritage is produced, manufactured 
um, and uh, consumed by tourists and uh, indeed intellectuals. So the intellectual aim of the project was to attempt to open up the boundaries between these totalities in culture, in culture and to write different histories, particularly the intertwined histories of seeming dis seemingly distant geographies. So instead of colonising the non-West, and by this we meant parts of Turkey and the Middle East, by mapping it using Western ideas of what cultural heritage might be, what's of value, different kinds of historical narrative structures, we tried to appreciate the complexity and diversity of this with different sets of values that operate within cultural frames. And this is just a page from um, the website um, of the project. And one of the, our main concerns was the uses of architecture and urban planning in the projection of national identities. And we looked at this in terms of Turkey, in terms of the way that um, uh, uh, the influx of foreign architects during the Republican period meant that, that modern Turkey was produced by a lot of European architects. Um, the engagement in Istanbul, for instance, um, in the 1930s and 40s was something that was looked at. And we also looked at the way in which different um, identities of Turkey were projected um, abroad, for instance, the um, Embassy of Turkey in Tehran and the Turkish Pavilion at the New uh, York World's Art Fair, uh, and how these interacted with their particular geographical location. Another thing we thought about was the way that British architecture and town planning was exported, particularly in the 1940s. Um, where exhibitions about British town planning toured um, Europe and Turkey and were consumed and were extremely influential to urban development at that time. Now my point in telling you all of this is that, to my mind, this shows the porosity of cultural heritage, that we can't look at it as something that is monolithic and can't change. It's something which has a completely shifting set of values and also interaction between the different cultures that observe, experience, and consume heritage. And so it's something that hasn't quite got the fixity uh, that we might um, necessarily uh, attribute it and, uh, initially. Now we had a great time with this project and we thought we'd come to some fantastic conclusions about how to think about cultural heritage and particularly the built environment, cultural landscapes in the post-Ottoman world. And towards the end of the British Academy funded project, which you see here, we had the Arab Spring, which of course changed everything completely. So we had to begin to think again about how you think about these particular environments. And since then, all that's been happening in the Middle East tells us that this shifting notion of what is of value, the kinds of um, values that are inherent and indeed imposed on particular cultural environments, can shift and change over time. So that's one thing about the political background uh, to how we view um, cultural heritage and cultural environments. The next area of consideration is the um, uh, cultural, um, the city of Tangier um, and the, its role, the role of cultural landscapes in the projection of national and transnational identities. And this is just to show you where Tangier is in China. You can see Beijing and Tangier is pretty uh, much, I don't know if this has a pointer, it might do, but yes it does. It's Tangier here. It's actually a port city, you know, it's slightly in the <coughs> Now this is a project that's ongoing with the um, University um, Parian uh, at the Pantheon Sorbonne, and also um, Tangier University, as was mentioned, the Centre for Chinese Cultural Heritage. And Tangier now is following in the footsteps of Beijing and Shanghai and undergoing rapid urban development. And when you visit Tangier, it has all these huge skyscrapers that are currently constantly under construction. And the historical part of the city is very much under threat because as I started at the beginning of this talk, land is valuable and land in the centre of Tangier is particularly valuable. So it's that kind of interaction or indeed tension, let's say, between trying to preserve what's there and also um, allow for this massive expansion so Tianjin can take on uh, the other, other major cities uh, in China. Now the difference in, uh, with Tianjin is that it's not only the city's international present-day urban identity 
that distinguishes it, but it's also the architecture and public spaces dating from its origins in the 19th century that are seen in cultural value and are mapped on to the future identity of Tianjin. These spaces are seen as um, foreign and a foreign design and therefore um, indicative of the kind of international pedigree that Tianjin has as being an international city in the 19th century which is projected into the 20th and the 21st century. This is a map of 19th century Tianjin with the river here flowing out to the sea and these are the different um, European concessions, there were nine of them that existed between about 1860 and 1940. This is the British concession, which was the largest, the French is next door. And these concessions themselves tell a story of the history of Europe. So in other words, after the First World War, various countries disappeared, so the concessions were sold on and bought as commercial enterprises. Um, Second World War, with the invasion of the Japanese and China, this whole thing just folded, the tent folded, and everything closed down. We then have the Cultural Revolution in China, but mysteriously, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the historic architecture was maintained because even during the reign of Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, it was seen as having cultural value. So, in other words, it, it's again bringing back this point of the political landscapes can change, and this can change the kind of meaning and value that we invest in these particular kind of landscapes. So the current strategy for urban development in Tianjin combines the renewal of these foreign spaces with the desire to promote a modern identity for the city. And this is the, there's a museum to the future of Tianjin, which I find absolutely amazing. We always associate museums with the past, and here we have a museum that actually projects the future of the city. And you can see here the importance of landscape, and by this I mean urban parks and gardens, which is a pretty rare thing in China. And this is a direct legacy of the urban spaces and cultural spaces that were a legacy of the um, uh, European concessions in the 19th century. I'm afraid you're going to have to take my word for it, that these modern buildings all refer to the historical architecture of the individual concessions. So you might have a skyscraper with the kind of temple portico on the top as a sort of nod to the uh, cultural legacy and value that's imbued in the um, historic centre of the building, of, of, of Tianjin. So in this way, Tianjin is, stands distinct from its main rivals, Beijing and Shanghai, as they strive to become um, world cities. Uh, and if we look at the strategies employed by Beijing and Shanghai, we can perhaps see more familiar examples of how the kind of cultural landscape and that idea of cultural heritage is harnessed into a kind of vision of the future and a projection of identity. This is a pretty miserable slide of the bird's nest in Beijing. But what it shows us is that in the 2008 um, Olympics and the run-up to it, this enabled its, uh, Beijing to portray itself as being at the vanguard of telling the history of the nation. Now this might have been an invented history, but again, that's part of the idea of, of cultural heritage, that it, is, it does have a kind of shifting notion of its value, the stories it tells, and how it can be used to project um, uh, national identities and tell stories um, about the future. So this new history of China was evident in the star architecture of the venues for the games and the substantial program of urban renewal that surrounded the whole thing. And the world-class buildings produced as part of the Olympic project more than adequately rose to the challenge of such keynote international architecture. Shanghai, with the World Expo of 2010, again enabled a repositioning of Shanghai on the global stage. And the international exhibition drew attention to the city's distinctive approach towards architectural progress and originality in design and emphasised the primacy <coughs> of urban living. Now, a common core in both strategies for Beijing and Shanghai was the reinvention of urban identity through history. They retold history, they reconfigured the cultural heritage, the cultural landscapes of their cities to promote a different kind of um, notion of what Beijing and Shanghai is about. In other words, they produce a new kind of modernity based on a, an invented cultural legacy. 
And both events are prompts, as I said, for the retelling of national narratives and the promotion of modernity. And the preservation and promotion of a manicure past is part of this process. And the Tangent is slightly different in that it offers a different kind of engagement with its historic past through a different kind of renegotiation of its historic and present relationship with um, its historic architecture and with its current modern identity. So in thinking about how we might intellectualize these ideas, um, I'm interested in the idea of the kind of spaces of memory in how memory operates in these cultural landscapes, these cultural environments, and how we project our own memories onto them, and then how we reuse those and um, how they relate to an invented history that becomes part of the projection of the future. Also in my work, uh, I've been looking very much at the relationship between Western and what we might call in the worst possible way, non-Western ideas. And again, I'm interested in how, looking at how Western settlements in China or the imposition of British planning ideas in the Middle East can offer us a kind of mirror image of um, our own ideas, and here I'm talking about my own ideas about British town planning and British urbanism. This is a kind of mirror that, dis that distorts and reinvents what I understand about, our own, uh, about my own work on urban planning, particularly in London. And I think, again, that brings me to the point about the dialogue between cultural heritage and cultural landscape, in that there is, a, there is no fixity, there is a dialogue. We have to be aware of our own position, why we think something matters, and then perhaps we can figure that in looking at it from another person's perspective. And certainly in my own work, that's something that I find extremely valuable. Now, I can see I'm being looked at, so I suspect <laughs> 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 no, I think actually that, that those are the main points that I wanted to make. So I'm not talking about monetary value, I'm talking about our own investment, of our own emotion, ideas, and why we think heritage matters. And in the end, if we don't think it matters, then nothing, to my mind, nothing matters very much. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.